It is my great pleasure to now introduce you all to our very special guest speaker today, Alexandra Rose. Um, Alexandra and I first met well over 18 months ago now. I think it was um, probably around January last year when Alexandra reached out to our club to make inquiries about the opportunity to apply for a Rotary Peace Fellowship, which is funded through the Rotary Foundation. Alexandra came along to a few meetings. She's spoken at the district conference. Some of you have obviously met uh, Alexandra already, but for many of you, you wouldn't have heard her story and a little bit of information um, about why she applied for a Peace Fellowship and what she's going to be doing that on. So I am not going to waste any more time. I'm going to introduce you to the amazing Alexandra Rose. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's so nice to be here. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Heidi. Namani, everyone. Tananda wama Ghana mina ya tanga yuanti. We are standing on Ghana land. And Tananda wama, the direct translation in the Ghana language for Adelaide Plains. Um, but that word refers specifically to the site that we're standing on today, which is the Adelaide Oval. So, uh, yeah, it's great to be here. I first came to a Rotary meeting and was so uh, inspired and impressed by listening to the people that were a part of Rotary and by hearing the guest speakers that they had at the time. So it feels a little bit surreal to be now one of your guest speakers, but I'm excited and grateful to be here. And yeah, I think as, as Heidi mentioned, I'm here, I guess, to introduce myself to you, to tell you a little bit about how I came into contact with Rotary and my plans over the next couple of years as I embark on my master's degree at the Rotary Peace Centre in North Carolina uh, in the US. And I also want to, uh, while I'm up here, introduce the Art Gallery of South Australia's Assistant Director, Dr Lisa Slade, who has come with me today and who will be um, happy to respond to any Art Gallery questions at the end as well. <laughs> so, yes, oh, my name is Alex. Um, I'm 32 years old and I was born in Adelaide. But, uh, sorry, I was born in Dubbo, but Adelaide has been home for me now for the past four and a half years. After removing here from a tiny remote town in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. And I think if you ask the Adelaide locals, that's a very well-worn migration pathway to get to Adelaide. <laughs> no, I've literally obviously never heard of anyone who's done it like that. But... In November last year, I found out that I was one of 50 candidates from across the globe to be made a recipient of the Rotary Peace Fellowship. And so with the generous support of Rotary, I will be packing up my life here in Adelaide and moving to Chapel Hill in North Carolina in July this year. So I might just start with a little bit of information about the Peace Fellowship, but I have no doubt that I am preaching to the converted here. Many of you will be somewhat familiar with these details. Uh, but the Peace Fellowship, uh, which in its current form began around 20 years ago, is a scholarship awarded to up to 50 dedicated leaders in the field of peace and conflict from all over the world to further their education and study a master's degree at one of Rotary's peace centres. Intimately connected to the vision of Rotary itself, the fellowship program has a vision of sustainable peace encompassing a network of community leaders and peace builders dedicated to preventing and resolving conflicts across the globe. Applicants can be from all sorts of professional backgrounds but must have demonstrated a commitment to service above self and have a professional CV related to peace building. So for me personally, I've chosen to use the fellowship to complete my Masters of Social Work at the University of North Carolina. It's an incredibly generous fellowship and I'm constantly reminded of what a life-changing opportunity Rotary has given me and I guess when I stop to think on that for me personally that feeling can be summed up as a very happy sense of responsibility one that is equally loaded in its duty but also liberating in its possibilities. So the practice of social work has been hanging around in my life for a little while now, and I've been working in the field for the past seven years. 
Essentially, social work is a practice-based profession that promotes social change and development, social cohesion, and the empowerment and liberation of people. It's informed by principles of social justice, human rights, collective responsibility, and respect for diversities. And the discipline has taken me to some really unusual and interesting places. So as I alluded to earlier, social work took me to Mongolia, where I worked on a short-term assignment for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as a child protection consultant, supporting the development and upskilling of the local workforce. Now, I went to Mongolia with a big toolkit for capacity building around children's safety and risk. But for the most part, my work related to supporting the local staff's efforts to implement dun, 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 the rights of child jockeys in springtime horse racing. <laughs> now, this is actually a really fascinating and unique cultural practice in Mongolia where children uh, who can compete from the age of seven years old compete bareback in a 25 kilometre horse race across the Mongolian steppe. The racing season happens over a number of months, so there's actually a huge amount of work to be done at this time, which is about ensuring children are reasonably safe as they undergo this fundamentally unsafe practice. <laughs> Um, but equipped with all sorts of Australian risk matrix and protection interventions, you can imagine my surprise when my director tasked me with about three months' worth of gently shaking kids to make sure that they had their helmets in place correctly. So this was uh, the centre of operations for one of the regional departments of child protection where I spent quite a lot of my time, um, and an example of the pre-race kits for the kids who were about to race in the step. So before Mongolia, social work took me to the tiny island nation of Nauru. It helped give me the confidence to eat the beating heart of the first yellowfin tuna that I caught with Nauruans, a nod to local custom and respect for the ocean. In the work environment on Nauru, social work helped me face the reality, which was that the refugee and asylum seekers' distress was raw, acute, and unable to be alleviated in the context of so much uncertainty and a very hostile policy environment. Many considered suicide as the only option to get to psychological freedom and to send a message of protest to the Australian government. Social work helped me bear witness to this human distress and my time in Nauru ultimately served to sharpen my commitment to social justice and becoming a more impactful agent of peace. Over the past four years in Adelaide, social work helped me understand and respond to gender-based violence at all levels of our community. Social work gave me the tools to work as the trauma practice leader for our national hotline for domestic and family violence, 1800 Respect. And in 2021, social work helped me set up and deliver South Australia's first specialised family violence service for domestic and family violence counselling for people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So, while social work has been a really important part of my life and career over the past seven years, it's not the only big passion in my life because another huge area of interest has been brewing in the sidelines. And now you're going to have to bear with me here because we're going to take a big detour away from social work, but we'll, we'll end up back here, so come along with me. Um, so since 2018, I've been volunteering at the David Roche Foundation. Now, I know some of you, hi Mary, some of you will be familiar with that. Does anyone, has anyone heard of the David Roche Foundation? Yeah, oh, brilliant. So you'll know, for those of you that have been, you'll know that it's a small house museum in North Adelaide, which is home to Australia's and arguably the Southern Hemisphere's best collection of privately owned decorative arts and antiques. I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, for someone that knew basically nothing about arts and antiques, the mice and swan dinner service really got me going. <laughs> and then there was the eclectic collection of Staffordshire pottery, not to mention the assortment of Cloisonnier walking sticks. Um, and if that didn't do it for me, then there was the Napoleonic dueling pistol made by the Swedish makers Derz Egg. 
So soon enough, the museum gave in to my incessant demands to become a guide there, and they put me through a traineeship in decorative arts and antiques. Let me ask you, Rotarians, have you ever cried at the beauty of a semi-skeleton mantle clock made in 1796 by the premier French enamelist Joseph Coteau? <laughs> no. Well, I have, but much to my complete surprise. <laughs> So, to cut a long story short, the David Roche Foundation awoke a dormant passion inside of me. And this passion has essentially taken over most areas of my life. I still guide regularly at the David Roche Foundation, and as a sidestep, I went on to train in gallery guiding at the Art Gallery of South Australia. This interest in storytelling and the beauty and importance of learning about history through objects has woven its way into the fabric of my life and late last year led me to make an apparently convincing pitch to Lisa Slade who offered me a role on a project which I've been in for the past six months. My work at the Art Gallery of South Australia has been fascinating. I'm currently leading the delivery and development of an interdisciplinary project which explores themes of social justice in the gallery's contemporary art collection. If you are a young woman who is enthusiastic and curious and knows a little bit about art and you have an outrageously colourful wardrobe with nowhere else to wear such things, then the Art Gallery of South Australia really does feel like home. Aside from being a place to look at wonderful work and wear clashing patterns, it's also a site for difficult conversations about history, whose history, about power, who has had it and who hasn't, and about how we do social justice. Is art a form of protest? Museums and galleries, as a reflection of society itself, are living through times of change. This shift comes with numerous challenges. As museums rightly strive to be more equitable and inclusive, they have a responsibility to represent the experiences of a diversity of voices and communities, especially as they relate to urgent social justice issues in contemporary Australia. In this way, our galleries and museums become sites for peace building in the broader sense of the word. I have found through my short time at the gallery so far, that this is a fertile and responsive space for this kind of work, both at the micro level in terms of the way that we talk to the public about art, but also at the macro level as we push for institutional change. So when thinking about these two big guiding lights in my life, I'm reminded of an anecdote about Peggy Guggenheim, the American heiress. Um, who, after returning from Europe to New York, went on to open her own gallery titled The Art of This Century. And for the opening party in 1942, Peggy wore one earring made for her by Yves Shanghai and another earring made for her by Alexander Caldor. And she did this to symbolise her loyalty and love and commitment and impartiality for both the surrealist and the abstract art movements. Now, I think about this story because I want to follow Peggy's lead, and yeah, you're going to have to use your imagination a little here because instead of Peggy Guggenheim, it's me. And instead of being an American heiress, I'm an Australian university student. Uh, instead of being about to open a gallery, I'm about to embark on a Rotary Peace Fellowship. But I am going to wear two earrings, figuratively anyway, one to symbolise my commitment to the field of social work and the other in respect and reverence for the work of galleries and museums. And I'll be wearing these figurative earrings over the course of the next few years as I bring my passion for social work together with my passion for galleries and museums to explore how can large-scale art institutions and museums better enhance our capacities for critical thinking, collective memory, peacemaking, and the transformation of ignorance into awareness? And what is best practice for galleries and museums when exhibiting works that memorialize and tell histories of trauma, war, displacement, and conflict? At this point, it's probably sounding very niche, but uh, if all goes according to plan, I'll feel equipped to work at institutions such as the Peace Museum in the UK, 
the 9-11 Memorial, Tool Sling Genocide Museum, or the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Now, who knows, maybe there's even scope to curate a museum dedicated to the amazing work that Rotary does across the globe. So having said all of that, um, and told you a bit about the direction that I'm heading in over the next couple of years, I wanted to talk to you about a work of art that brings these ideas together. Now, some of you might know it. I'm going to tell you the title and then I'll show you some pictures. Um, the title of the work is called Absence Embodied and it's by the artist Chiharu Shiota. I know a couple of you will be familiar. Does that name ring any bells for anyone? Thank you, Linda, yes. Um, what about if I show you this image? Does that, yes, a few more people familiar with it now, great. So I want to tell you a little bit about the artist and her background, um, and then I'll show you some images of the installation of this particular work. So Chiharu Shioda, she is a Japanese artist. She was born in Osaka in 1972, but she's been exhibiting and, and making work for galleries since about 1992. Now, she's most well-known for her string installations, and over time, I guess, thread has become her signature tool of expression. She's one of those artists that always knew that she wanted to be an artist, and from a very young age, she always said that art was the framework or the paradigm through which she wanted to engage with the world. Now, after a concerted effort by the Art Gallery of South Australia, they arranged for Chiharu's work to be installed, which made it the only public institution in the world to have a permanent installation of her work, um, which is a huge achievement for a gallery here. Now, it's often not known that 100% of acquisitions at the Art Gallery of South Australia are funded through private philanthropy. Um, and it's been that way for the past 12 or so years, as it is with most other major art institutions in Australia. And this work is no different. It was made possible by donors Andrew and Hiroko Gwinnett, um, who are long-standing gallery benefactors. But I think that that point is worth noting because it tells a great story about the way in which private money can be democratised uh, and in a way so that hundreds of thousands of people ultimately get to tap into some of those social and cultural benefits and outcomes of it. Now, the work was installed in Gallery 14 of the Melrose Ring. It's been on display since 2018, and it's still there now, so you can all go and see it. The work itself, we're about to see some images, uh, is a number of cast bronze sculptures of the artist and her daughter's hands and body parts. Uh, and some of those bronze sculptures act as anchors to a charge of red wool which extends upwards and outwards, creating a 3D labyrinth. Now, the installation, this is, so this is Gallery 14 of the Melrose Wing uh, in 2018, and the installation itself took a month to complete. It was done by a team of about 10 AXA staff and two of her studio assistants who came over from Berlin, and as well as the artist herself. So you can start to get a sense of how this work is filling the space. Uh, so 1,800 balls of red wool were dropped off at AXA, and the total distance that they've traversed in Gallery 14 is 240 kilometres, which is actually longer than the distance of the York Peninsula. Uh, you can imagine that it was quite a marathon process of plotting out the coordinate points, the contact points, uh, and, and mapping those out with hundreds of thousands of staples. Now, some themes of this work, uh, if I just skip forward here, I guess the theme of connection is really important in Chiharu Shiota's body of work. Uh, you know, connecting between points, connecting between lines, connecting between people and spaces. And it can remind us that over the course of our life, we might be connected or be tethered in innumerable ways, connected to people, connected to ideas and experiences. And some of those connections will be really permanent, and others of them might be quite fleeting. 
And the line, the idea of the line here is both fragile and powerful. It's it can bridge anything from humans to spaces, but it can also easily break when put under pressure. Now, there's a, a well-regarded theory in contemporary art that says a work of art is never fully finished until the viewer engages with it. And so I really enjoy um, bringing people to this work of art to hear some of those responses. Some people say when they walk into the space that they feel really comforted by it, that it's like a warm, fuzzy blanket and they can imagine themselves wrapped within it. Other people say that it reminds them of maps. You know, those before COVID, of course, those airline maps that would show all of the active flights or the trade route maps. And other people say that it reminds them of hundreds of thousands of tiny blood vessels in a kind of life-sustaining force. <clears throat> and I like all of these ideas. I mean, they say something about connection. They say something about permanence and impermanence. They say something about presence and absence and about what it looks like when hundreds of thousands of tiny connections are all mapped into the one space. And if you let your imagination take you there, you might start to liken this to the way that Rotary works. Now, I chose this work because I was thinking of the incoming presidential theme, which is Imagine Rotary, um, which was announced by the incoming president-elect Jennifer Jones. And it made me think, when I looked at the logo of Imagine Rotary, I thought that it left a little bit to be desired. And I thought, what work of art in the Art Gallery of South Australia's collection would represent this idea of Imagine Rotary. And so I wonder for you what it might be like in moments where you need to have an image that comes along with this idea of Imagine Rotary, what it would be like to have this image of Chihara Shioda's work in your mind. You might think of the ways in which connection becomes visible, uh, becomes strong and becomes embodied when it's considered and layered and mapped out through a coordinated exercise of teamwork into tiny and hundreds of thousands of tiny connections all across the globe. So that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation today. I, you know, you've all played an important part in my journey because it's this district, thank you Heidi, who has endorsed my application for a Peace Fellowship. So I'm really grateful and thank you so much for having me. Okay, we have a few minutes for some questions. So um, wasn't that an amazing presentation? It actually almost made me cry, Alex. And what a beautiful representation of Rotary that you, you projected. Thank you. Okay, question from Jill Chapman. Hello, Alex. Thank you so much for such a um, beautifully put together and heartfelt uh, and engaging presentation. It was wonderful. Can I take you back to your time in Nauru and ask you how you coped as a human being with what you saw, how you managed to debrief and then leave that um, commission knowing that perhaps not a lot had changed? Thank you. That's a great question. I guess, um, you know, I like in social work, we have a lot of training in a professional sense around managing our own experience of that. But, but part of the way of coping with that is knowing that that is the reality, not trying to sugarcoat it, not imagining that things are going to be different, but bearing witness to the genuine nature of the distress that's occurring at that time. And there's a real strength and forbearance in the clients that we're working with. Um, social workers often describe that it's never the client that burns us out or that makes us feel disconnected from the work. It's always the systems that we're working within. And that was very much the same for Nauru. Ultimately, an argument that many of us made was that, look, if we are people that care about social justice, we believe in human rights, we believe in the empowerment of people that we're here with, 
then there is a small difference that we can make, even if it's just a dignity-based approach to someone who's in detention, or even if it's just an empowerment approach for someone who has been denied their visa for the umpteenth time. Uh, there are very few refugees, detainees left on Nauru. There's only a small amount, perhaps about 20. So at the time I was there, we were working with a population of around 3,500. So things have changed there, even though the policy remains in place. Um, but ultimately, the strength, the courage, the resilience, the dignity all comes from the clients themselves. And we're just lucky and privileged to witness that in that space. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question, Frank. Uh, Alexandra, congratulations on your uh, Peace Fellowship Award. Uh, my question goes more to your involvement in art. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, most art is provided through donations of private individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the ages, uh, institutions acquired art of... Uh, uh, that projected a particular perspective of history mm -hmm. that now seen through the, uh, the prism of presentism is no longer acceptable. And an example that comes to mind immediately is a family in the US who gave $12 million, the Sackler family. Mm -hmm. You have the Rhodes Foundation, you have the slavery uh, beneficiaries. How do you resolve this tension between art as we understand it, which is an aesthetic, and the social justice, human rights perspective that we put on how we value our lives today. I think that's why I've brought Dr. Lisa Slade with me. So can I defer to you? Lisa, the microphone's coming to you. Um, A truly excellent question and probably the subject for a full forum, I would suggest, because there is so much in what you've just said. The word that springs to mind is actually consent. And in negotiating art experiences for contemporary audiences, obtaining the consent of the artists, the communities and the audiences is kind of the first point of practice for us. And if I could give you an example, we have a festival every two years called Tanandi, a Ghana word that describes the first light of day. It's funded by BHP. As I'm sure you can imagine, that has been the source of some quandary and some questioning. Our first position in accepting those funds was to ask Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists and their communities their perspective or position on being funded through that program to make art. So it's through consent that we negotiate some of those pathways and steps. The second part of my answer, and I probably could give 200 answers to the question, is that I feel as though Alex's work with the Vanguard group also goes some way to the decolonizing, decentralizing that you speak of or imply with regard to presentism. So working with the 25, Alex has done an extraordinary job of recruiting. We had 60 expressions of interest. From that, she recruited 25, 20 to 30 year olds who meet, who meet weekly. Over the course of their training, we have lost just one to full-time employment. So, uh, many of them are actually full-time employed. They just negotiate, as you do, to be here today. Their absenteeism at that particular time. Alex has been working with that group to bring their social, political and cultural selves to the gallery so that the difficult conversations can, in, in effect, be kind of Trojan horsed, if you like, within the, within the context of the gallery. So that when we look at the history of philanthropy and benefaction, particularly where it might have a dark history, frank, fearless, open and hopefully productive conversations can be had in that space. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, can we get you back to give us a bigger speaker, please? Thank you. Because we have to wrap up now. But Alexandra, um, on behalf of everybody, we wish you all the very, very best in, um, in North Carolina on your Peace Fellowship. We look forward to staying in touch with you. And your beautiful partner, Dave, is going with you as well. So Dave, keep us informed. Uh, you're going in about six weeks? Yep, six weeks' time. Have the time of your lives. Thank you so much. Uh, Rotarians and guests, please thank Alexandra for...